Hi everybody, Josh with Talk About Trek, and I am back with something different, something special for the month of January. I've decided to make January the month of honor, and we'll be reading the Day of Honor saga, I should say. So, <clears throat> this giant book here is one, two, three, four, five, six collected books, and I have just finished book one, which is Diane Carey's Ancient Blood, a thrilling story of the Revolutionary War. Uh, not what I expected, but <laughs> it was actually very, very fun. Uh, just kind of went in a different way. Let's read the blurb from the, uh, the back here. <coughs> well, first off, this is the About Day of Honor here. Together in one volume, six complete novels that explore the heart and soul of Klingons everywhere. The true Klingon warriors, no occasion is more sacred than the Day of Honor, when they pay homage to all that makes them Klingon, but honor can take many forms. I see. Okay. Worf finds his honor tested when he goes undercover to infiltrate a planetary criminal network. Along with his son, Worf must confront deadly danger, as well as deceit and corruption. So, <coughs> excuse me. The Day of Honor miniseries kind of came about, uh, and I kind of found what was interesting was that this miniseries was the only kind of book to inspire an episode. So the Voyager episode, Day of Honor, is actually inspired by this book series, and that's actually uh, the novelization is one of the books included in that, so we will be able to get to that too. But let's start here with Diane Carey's Ancient Blood. Now, I'm sure I've read some of Diane Carey's stuff before. Uh, this was good. Uh, I, I think that she did a good job of writing the characters, um, kept a very, very good pace throughout the book, but it was definitely not what I was expecting. Uh, and first off, look at the, that's the cover of the book there, as you can see. Uh, and if you were to see that, you might be expecting there would be a bird of prey, possibly in this, <laughs> or, or at least some kind of uh, maybe Klingon space cruiser or something. No, nothing of that kind is going to happen here. So uh, what we have here is basically two stories. You got your A story and your B story. Uh, the Enterprise has been called to kind of help investigate this criminal organization on the planet Syndicash. Uh, the first thing they have to do is pull over this uh, transport that's transporting these two witnesses that are finally going to come forward against this uh, you know, terrible kind of mob boss character there on Syndicash. Uh, when they pull the ship over, they're horrified to find that everyone there is dead and their arms have been physically removed from their bodies. And the arms are not even there. They're gone. <laughs> gone completely. Where are the arms? I don't think they ever explain. But uh, a terrible sight. They, they basically kind of start the book. They're knee-deep in blood. The, the whole away team is, you know, sloshing through blood. Uh, and just kind of sets the tone, or they're trying to set the tone, I guess, for exactly how how evil that this group, this uh, syndicate is that they're going after. So they decide that they have to come up with a, a covert mission. They need to get somebody on the inside there who can get their trust, and they can finally get the proof they need to bring them down. Uh, now, this, uh, the, uh, it's the governor's wife, who is the, uh, the antagonist here. Her name is Odette Canty, and uh, basically, they know that she is a criminal, but thus far, she has kept her hands completely clean, and they just have no proof. Uh, she is guarded by this group of, I think, 10 or 12 Klingon rogues, is what, what they call them, led by Ugilan. And these rogues are uh, the ones suspected of pulling off all of the arms. This, of course, upsets Worf very much, who says, you know, that's not something that Klingons do. Klingons don't go around pulling off people's arms. There's no honor in that. And it makes sense. You know, that's not something they do. They don't really delight in torture. So these rogues are a little bit of a, a different breed of Klingon, I guess you could say. So, Worf is sent on this undercover mission to go there and gain the trust of uh, this Odette Canty so they can get the proof they need. And he's given a partner. And lo and behold, the partner, whose name is 
Ross Grant, or Grant Ross. I keep saying it the other way around. Anyway, we're going to call him Grant. Uh, Grant for uh, is actually, I guess you could kind of say like a godson to Alexander. Grant is someone that knew uh, Worf's previous love, Kalar. Uh, so someone that was in Alexander's life to kind of almost be like an uncle figure for him. And also... Um, very close to Worf as well. Worf has uh, grown close to him over the years, and uh, even though he's not uh, a warrior, so Grant is a computer expert, and he kind of deals with getting into systems, finding information, and getting things out, and that's why he's teamed up with Worf on this mission. Even though it's kind of a coincidence, it's still, that's how it's going to go. So we've set the stage for the first story. Worf and Grant on their way to Syndicash, they're going to worm their way into Odette's uh, little crew. Now, the B story is actually where I thought the story shined the most, which was Captain Picard. Now, Worf, before he left, has asked Captain Picard to take Alexander through the Day of Honor ceremony. Now, the Day of Honor ceremony is like a multiple-day thing where Klingons are supposed to kind of examine themselves and kind of learn, learn more about themselves and more about the the honor of their enemies and the honor that they have. So uh, they decide to do this via a hollow program and it's up to Alexander to choose. And Picard was thinking that Alexander would choose, you know, some kind of Klingon ancestor or something like that to, to work through and learn from for this adventure. But he actually chose a hollow program that was based on the journal of an ancestor of uh, his human side of the family that fought in the Revolutionary War. And this was a, a British soldier. So they are going to enter into basically a, a hollow program following the life of this British soldier at some point during the Revolutionary War. So right away you have two very, very different stories. Uh, you know, Picard during the Revolutionary War with young Alexander, which is just something you wouldn't expect when you're coming into this book at all. And then the other side, you have Worf kind of being very on Worf like uh, working his way into this, this criminal organization. So again, not what I expected when I was first picking up this giant book, I'm thinking like honor and like, it's going to be like a lot of, a lot of like real Klingon stuff, you know? Uh, but this one was not, but it did have a lot of honor in it. So I, I did like that. Uh, and in just all different ways, too. So uh, so you've got your A and your B story both going hot now. Uh, now for the... Like I said, the, the B story is, I think, is so much better than the A story because the A story has a lot of suspension of disbelief for me. Uh, he, he's so easily able to work his way into the good graces of this uh, this criminal mastermind, supposedly. Uh, and and right along, you know, right on his heels, of course, is his good friend Grant. And he's like, well, I won't come in unless my friend Grant comes in, too. You know, it's not that simple. There's more to it than that. But uh, just the whole kind of joining up, it seemed like it was, uh, I had to, like, just kind of wink and nod and say, okay, well, he's part of the group now. And now he's going to work his way towards being trusted. And of course, at first, he's not really trusted. I mean, they actually do have a whole big thing of him being like arrested and kind of working his way into her good graces. But it all happens really fast and kind of falls into place really easily. And it almost made me think that like they were kind of double dealing. Like they knew who he was and he didn't know that they knew who, you know. So, but then let's jump back to the other story. Now, Picard is on board the uh, HMS Justine, a uh, British frigate, which has come to assault a shipyard, and I think it was somewhere near Baltimore. And they've, uh, they've run into a bit of trouble. They've run into uh, some smaller boats, which have run them aground, and have actually, the uh, colonials there have taken the ship. Now, Picard is, uh, in the hollow program, has taken on the role of a lieutenant, and young Alexander there is taking on the role of like a, a swab, a role of a swab. So uh, all of the stuff on the boat, I really enjoyed, which made me think I might enjoy reading like a whole book about, uh, you know, British Navy or something like that. But uh, 
I digress. I'm getting distracted. Uh, that was all really well done. So I think Diane Carey did a great job with that. It all seemed like, I mean, all the wording, everything just sounded really good. Nothing seemed forced or weird. Like with the other story, I just I wasn't feeling it as much. This was all flowing along really well, and I was really getting into it. Uh, so they have a bit of trouble, like I said, and of course um, they go ashore with Picard, Alexander, uh, and who they determined to be Alexander's ancient relative, who is this Alexander Leonfeld, who is a uh, one of the British militia that was stationed on the boat there who is the lieutenant, I think, now promoted to captain since most of the other crew is dead. Now, they went ashore to attach a line to a tree so the ship could kind of get itself off of the off of the sandbar, but it was too late. The colonials end up taking the ship, the crew of the ship surrenders, and then they are forced to flee into the woods and take cover. So that story is rolling along, and it's really fun. And then you go back to the wharf story, and it's good, too. It's fun. Uh, Worf now is on a mission with the rogues, and I'm definitely, I'm glossing over a lot of this, so he has to go on a mission with the rogues to kind of prove himself, and they kind of plan this out ahead of time, apparently, because he ends up killing Commander Riker, and um, kind of making his way out of there, and this kind of earns him the trust of the rogues, that he's able to do that, and he's actually put into a kind of a position of more power there, so... Um, but then it kind of all starts to fall apart there at that point. Uh, during all of this, Grant is busily working away. And this is the other part that just seems so strange to me, that this criminal mastermind would have this person just staying there with Worf, not like doing anything, not doing any work for her that they speak of, just hanging out and apparently just accessing the computers all day. Just <laughs> So... Uh, I think maybe that was just kind of irking at me, irking at my head the whole time, uh, and I could never kind of get past it. But it was at this point in the story that I began to think that, okay, they're working up to something kind of interesting. There's going to be a cool twist here in this side. And I actually said to my daughter, because we're, there was an episode on of TNG at the time, The Dolphin, I said, Odette Canty is going to be one of them shapeshifters, and she's the one that was ripping off everyone's arms. So just keep that in your head for now. That, that's what I was thinking. But So Worf has worked his way into the fold there. He's part of the group, but he's, they're not learning anything more, really. They're not silly. So they need to do something more. So uh, going back to the Picard story, they have to seek shelter. Uh, luckily, uh, <clears throat> uh, Lieutenant Leonfield has a relative there. Uh, a colonialist who, who moved over there and has like a business in the area. So they go and they seek him out and they find him, uh, only to find that he is actually with the rebels. And um, Sandy, that's the, the, what they call this, Lieutenant Leonfold, Sandy is devastated. He is like a true blue royalist, uh, loyal to King George, and just cannot believe at all that his his cousin would dare do this. I mean, he was, they were very close and... Uh, it's kind of something that's kind of eating him up inside now, that his cousin would dare betray the crown. But then uh, his cousin, I didn't write down his name, but I have to find his name, Jeremiah. His cousin Jeremiah, I remembered that. His cousin Jeremiah is, goes on kind of extolling, you know, the, their side of it. The, you know, their side, they're fighting for their freedom, they're fighting for their representation. And, you know, what right does the crown have to tell them what they're meant to be, you know? So, and you, you just see, like, these these two cousins and, like, the, the both of their, their honor and their sides of the honor and the, you got Picard and he's looking at it and he's, like, he's starting to see, like, different sides of it and the whole thing is really, I think, working out well for Alexander who's getting to see kind of all these different sides and these different men speaking of all this different kind of honor and it's very honorable. <laughs> <laughs> but it just uh, just some of the stuff like is just kind of crazy. So there, in the end, basically what happens is uh, the British are coming. They're coming to the town now. They've uh, come to recapture their ship. But like all these men are like so bound by these different like kind of codes of honor 
uh, they basically agree that you know you can come out with us don't suit us in our backs uh, and we won't turn you in to the rest of the colonials so you won't be hung you know because he doesn't want his cousin to die and uh so they agree to do that and you kind of then it's just you get this weird situation where you have this kind of group of four you know red coats in disguise kind of in the midst of the battle between the red coats and the colonials there and the, the colonials are kind of overpowered as well there there's definitely more uh, coming down on them that they can handle so the battle doesn't go their way uh, they flee and kind of break up the, the the team there breaks up and gets away as well they get to the Justine and they manage to retake the ship and they uh, keep the colonials from kind of setting fire to it, which is what they would have done if they had made away. So uh, that's kind of the end of their little adventure. Uh, just very interesting discussions there, like in that little house of uh, Jeremiah Leonfeld, where Sandy and Jeremiah are arguing back and forth about their different views of honor. And it's just, it wasn't what I was expecting in the first book of the Day of Honor series. But in the end, that all worked out really, really well. Uh, in the final battle, Alexander kind of shows himself to have understood, like, what it really means to be honor. And about how honor is more about, like, why you fight and not, like, how you fight. And uh, in the end, like, he doesn't take up arms against the colonials and just chooses to not do anything because he realizes, you know, their side at first. At first he didn't realize it, but then he kind of, he comes around in the end and even uh, jumps into the final fray and takes like a nice, a nice uh, sword wound across his chest, uh, but, but keeps battling. Um, and one of the things they did with this little kind of hollow deck program is they made sure to say it wasn't a traditional hollow deck program it was an old journal converted into a, a hollow thing a hollow program so it could be a little wonky with the safeties and they would like it when picard would say freeze program it, like it wouldn't wouldn't do it right away or maybe like just slow down a little bit so they were trying to give the impression that you know something could happen maybe the safeties weren't in full effect and and there was some damage there and you could see uh, i got a nice big scar that uh, alexander took there so we go back, let's finish out Worf's story, because it does kind of finish off in an unremarkable, well, I don't know, not as good a way as I would have hoped, I guess. Basically, their plans are foiled. So when Worf is finally given kind of like the, he's got her in her good graces, and he's guarding her husband, who's uh, lying deathly ill, and he is on guard duty for that. And this gives him the chance to give Grant the chance to go in there and get into those computers and get the evidence he needs from the the, the main computer, which is there in the, the room with the, the guy that's dying, the, the governor. I, I just This part of the story was just so weird, too. But anyway, uh, Grant in there witnesses Odette coming in and poisoning the governor. He sees it himself. He sees it with his own two eyes. And he goes and he runs out and he tells Worf about it. And when they go back in, of course, she's gone. Now, Worf, of course, believes that Grant did see that, and the governor does die, and um, Grant is able to even say, I saw her poison him, so the doctors are able to kind of confirm that, which takes a little bit of the suspicion, you know, the suspicion away from him, right? But it's just all so weird and convoluted. Like, why, why was the computer in there? Why did, I mean, why was he in there? Why didn't he stop her when he saw her he just like i just looked and watched her as she did it like that, that part was all very kind of strange to me but he did get some um he said he did he like he has worse belief but on this planet in order to basically testify you have to have two eyewitnesses and he says to Worf, he's like you know you know that i'm telling you the truth all you have to do is just say that you saw her poison him. Even though you didn't, even though you were in the hall, you just have to come and lie under oath and perjure yourself and say that you saw her do it. And he can't do it. He can't do it. And that's like, that's the end of the mission, basically, or that part of the mission for him. Uh, his honor refuses to let him lie. He will not lie under oath, even though he knows it'll put her away, 
even though he knows that by not doing it, he's leaving Grant in a, a bad situation. Um, so he's exposed. He gets sent back to the Enterprise. Uh, there on the Enterprise, uh, Picard does a little bit of wink, wink, nod, nod, and authorizes this kind of secret mission and uh, sends Worf back, but this time with the help of Data, Riker, and Crusher. Again, this part of the story seems crazy, too. Like, wow, okay, they're really doing that. But they go back, they go to the planet, they're able to kind of hide themselves in orbit. They beam themselves directly out of the, into the door to his prison cell, only to find that they are too late. Grant, indeed, is dead. And not just dead, she tortured him, apparently, for a very long time before she strung him up and he slowly strangled to death. It's like, oh my god, that's dark. Like, terrible. <laughs> and like, oh, you know, Worf's going to be so angry. And of course he is. He's awful. But, uh, it's just, it's such a weird, <laughs> I don't know. Again, like, it was, it was a good story, but just some of the things that happened just seemed very, very strange. So anyway, they, they went right in there, and of course, uh, who comes in right behind them, but all the rogues and Odette Candy. Oh my goodness, they're all caught now. Oh no. <laughs> so uh, they um, they immediately scan them and they take away all of the listening devices that they had hidden on them and stuff. Uh, they, they tie up Riker and Crusher and then they tie up Worf to like the, the jail cell and then they string up Data by the neck. And Data at this point is actually done up to look like a human so they don't know that he's an android. So they string him up by the, de by the neck and he does a convincing job of convincing them that he's uh, dead. So you got like this dead, he's like hanging there acting like he's dead basically. And, and that's when this Odette Canty kind of does her megalodemiacal villain speech where she goes over and just says, oh yes, I did all of that and I murdered my husband too. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, kind of silly there at the end, but basically that was the idea the whole, all along. I think they wanted to get her to confess. Uh, Worf had to take a little bit of a beating. She kind of beat him with this cattle prod kind of thing. But after a little bit of while, she got stupid enough to basically confess to everything, which is when uh, Data kind of woke up and uh, revealed that he'd been recording everything. And not only recording it, live streaming it to the entire planet. So this lady is screwed already. Uh, everybody knows she's just admitted that she killed her husband, she killed Grant, and that she basically called the whole planet a bunch of idiots, and she was going to you know, <laughs> be happy to take them all over. So, wow. She's in trouble. So, uh, this is when the away team kind of springs, in spring, springs into action and takes out the, the crew of rogues. Uh, Data is able to kind of jump down and handily take them out. Dr. Crusher is hypo spraying him to the face and neck left and right. And uh, Riker, Riker's punching him and doing some fun stuff. So, so yeah, they, they take them out. Odette, <laughs> this last part's kind of funny too. And I, I see what the author was doing and it was kind of cool. But it was also kind of funny. But anyway, she's scrambling to get away. And here was the part where I was hoping she was going to transform into a seven foot tall shapeshifter and start ripping people's arms off. No, she doesn't. She's just, she's running away. And everyone's like, uh, Worf's like, I'm going after her. Don't follow me. And she, everyone's like, if she's getting away, you better run, Worf. Worf's like, I'm not going to run. So you got this this kind of chapter of Worf just slowly walking, step by step. He's not running, just... Choop, 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 choop. Just kind of following her throughout her compound. And the, the police are slowly closing in. It's like she has like nowhere to go here, nowhere to go here, nowhere to go here. And Worf is just slowly... Choop, 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 step by step by step. Inch by inch. And he's getting closer and closer. And eventually this whole thing proceeds all the way up to the roof of the compound. Where he takes it right to the edge of the roof. And he tells her, you did two things wrong. You killed my friend and you did something else. <laughs> but anyway. The, man, this was a weird book, but it was fun. Okay. So anyway, we're at the end here. Worf doesn't shove her off the building. Worf doesn't rip her arms off. Worf, of course, grabs her by the arm and places her under arrest. Because that's what Starfleet does. <laughs> uh, so that was also kind of interesting, too, because you really were thinking, you know, this, what, what's he going to do? 
he's, he's so mad. He's just walking. He's just walking. Walking the whole time over there. So, but yeah, uh, in the end, he's able to get back. Uh, get, you know, they have the proof that they need. They have her in custody. However, it wasn't a successful mission because apparently the planet there still voted to leave the Federation, which was one of the issues that they were deciding on. But in the end, after Picard's, you know, thoughtful trip through the Hollow Suite, he decides that, you know, they should decide for themselves anyway. And if they voted, that's how they voted. So, an interesting end to a very interesting book, which had a very, very split A and B plot that uh, kind of weaved in and out. Um, some things I liked that the author did here were like, good time skips to take it like right from the conference room now all of a sudden worse on the planet you know that kind of stuff was good um, excellent writing with all of the British naval stuff that was so very fun and uh, made me want to read like I could read like a whole book of like Picard and a hollow program doing like master and commander that kind of thing so uh, that would be very good all right notes from the big book here um, I did think it was interesting in here that when they were talking to the author about the book, she actually said that Picard chose the Revolutionary War program. But it was it was Alexander himself that chose it. So, uh, you know, that, that was kind of interesting. So, you know, she forgot her own book, apparently. <laughs> but anyway, it was a good book, and it was fun. Uh, I am going to keep right on with the Day of Honor giant book here. And we're going to jump right into some Deep Space Nine with L.A. Graff's Armageddon Sky. Another good thing about jumping into this is I get to do a little bit more. I did not read enough Deep Space Nine or Voyager last year. So I'm going to start out January with a nice big chunk of DS9 and Voyager and hopefully some really good honor and some Klingon stuff, you know. So we'll see what the next one has to bring us. So. <sighs> I talked about that book for too long. Uh, as always, everyone, I want to say thank you so much for watching. Glory to the Empire. Good night.